Dead Space was an attempt to make the scariest game of all time. Creator Glenn Schofield has this fantastic War Stories interview where he talks about the creative process and you know it's always a pleasure hearing someone talk about something they created that you love, being able to tell just how much they love it too. You had to have loved what you were making in those days, back in 2008 there were a lot of new games coming out, a lot of sequels but some fresh franchises too, usually made by these not quite AAA developers, at least compared to how things are now. Sort of mid-range, mid-budget games that, although they were published by big companies like EA or Activision, still had a team of like-minded people driving the game creatively. Which isn't to say you don't have that now, but there's far less. Those super creative voices often get drowned out when their company gets purchased outright. There's a point in that interview where Schofield talks about what he went on to do afterwards, and it's a little sad for me to look at. From Dead Space, he ended up getting hired for Modern Warfare 3, Infinite Warfare and World War 2, straight into Call of Duty. And I'm not saying those games are completely terrible, Modern Warfare 3 was fine, but had zero innovation, and the same goes for the other two. I kinda hated World War 2 actually. Apart from that zombie mode, it seemed to inject some horror back into things. I wonder if that's his influence. Regardless, those games are far away from that ragtag group of people making something completely new that they're all passionate about. And you know, fair enough, I'm glad for Showfield's success in this, but there is a spark that went out there it seems. I mean, what's the alternative? Keep making creator-driven, artful, big-budget games? Look what happened to Ken Levine and Bioshock Infinite. An incredible game, no doubt, and one of my favourites of all time, but it all became too much for Levine and the team. Budgets ballooned, and with them expectations and it all got a bit too big for its boots, leading Levine to drastically scale back the team afterwards to concentrate on more smaller developer-led projects. It might just be that endeavours like that aren't scalable up to the AAA level. When the budget gets bigger, you need to make back more, you need to sell the game to more people, so things tend to become broader in their appeal. Dead Space, I think, strikes a balance here, specifically because the setting was already a proven concept. If you go back to the first Alien movie, it wasn't really, and that film involved quite a lot of auteur people working on something that might not succeed. Space horror hit the ground running with Alien, but coming much later, when the Alien franchise had already blown its load, was Event Horizon, which is cited as a big inspiration for this title. Glenn Schofield talks about watching literally hundreds of movies and getting a handful of ideas from each. He talks about Alien, Event Horizon, and The Thing especially. A spaceship literally going to hell in Event Horizon, the bleakness of Alien, the transformations from the thing, and you can see it all when you play, there's bits and pieces from everywhere, for better and for worse. In terms of story, it's hitting those same beats that you'll see elsewhere. Rescue ship crashes, there's something not quite right, you've got to find a way to escape but someone you went there with betrays you, you know, it's close to a few different things. Playing through it again, it's interesting how much what happens in Alien Isolation mirrors this plot. It all went full circle, apparently. You can criticise the game on some of this, though. All those inspirations in the mixing pot made for a story that wasn't exactly original. The game didn't bring much new to the table, not story-wise. There's other things that make this title work, though. So let's get into some of the nuts and bolts and design decisions to figure out exactly why this thing was so successful. Let's begin with Isaac himself, because everything kind of blossoms from there. The most defining feature is the lack of a non-diegetic heads-up display, to use the proper media critiquing lingo. It's a cleverly implemented system, and a consistent one. Just having that health bar and meter on your back is a stroke of genius for immersion. It can go as deep as possible because of it, with the only artificial element being that fourth wall itself. Talking about immersion is always a kind of abstract concept and a cliched area to discuss, but the way I look at it is like this. If you've played a lot of games before and you pick up a new one, you're sort of running two ideas in your head while getting into it. First is the surface level. It's the story, it's the setting, the dialogue, context, characters, colour. But then there's a deeper layer and it's something most experienced by, as I say, people who have played a lot of games. It's the mechanics underneath, it's the numbers, the repeated animations, it's seeing through to the human who designed it and figuring out what it is that they want from you. 
You can get to a point where the textures stop mattering, for example, where background detail is irrelevant, where objects without collision mean nothing, and you're just blasting around like a pinball. You just see hitboxes, you just see your health, the enemy's health, and ammo numbers. You see that this boss shoots five of these, then you're allowed to respond twice, then it repeats three times, etc, etc. I hope you get a feel for what I mean here, because the most important and interesting thing to point out, as well as the most successful feature of Dead Space, is the way that it avoids this tendency for players to break through to the mechanics underneath. Now, some games are designed exactly for players to get through to this. They want you to understand the underlying systems and exploit them, almost mathematically. But a lot of story-heavy games don't want this to happen, because it breaks that ever-fragile idea of immersion. Horror games, in particular, have to be very careful with this, because as soon as you see the enemies you face as simple models with repeating animations and sound effects laid on top, it's all just gone, and you can't get it back. One of my favourite horror games ever is Amnesia The Dark Descent. Now, I did a video on this a few years ago where I go into how clever all the design is there, but the thing is, on subsequent playthroughs you can start to see the gears turning beneath its systems. You realise that you weren't in danger when you thought you were, and that the AI can be tricked. At this point it's all over, and you can't get back to that original feeling. Dead Space knows that this can happen. It knows players might just try to run past enemies, and it knows they might try to cheese them, and it has measures put in place to prevent this. There's a few. First, the speed of the monsters compared to the player stops most occasions where you're tempted to simply run past. Second, it's the sheer relentlessness of their attacks. More on this in a moment. Third, it's the overall use of sound. Again, more on this in a sec. And fourth, it's the detail of the environment and the monster's place within it. By this I mean the simple fact that necromorphs come out of vents in the walls and ceilings stops you as a player looking at rooms and corridors as mere boxes. In Dark Souls, enemies are placed along the path of the world, and although they've got better at integrating them in later games, it's still essentially true right down to Elden Ring. And it's a conscious choice, don't get me wrong, FromSoft want to imply a sort of fairness in their purposefully unforgiving games. They'll hide enemies and trick you, but they'll be in the same place next time, usually. In Dead Space, it wants you to feel like your enemy is all around you, and you're never safe. The system for enemy spawning is semi-randomised, so between deaths it'll never play out exactly the same twice. Your options for being prepared and being in a position to say to yourself, right, I'm powerful and I'm good to go, are limited. When it comes down to it, you're expected to perform under pressure, time and time again. Which is where the sheer relentlessness of the attacks comes in. You can tell yourself it's okay, I know they won't actually all hit me at once, and I do have time to reload here, but it's a difficult thing to really grok when these bastards are sprinting at you full speed with arms flailing, your ammo is running dry, and the world is screeching. The sound is doing a lot here. Schofield talks in that interview about that one room you go into where it's just sheer noise. And how playtesting players would automatically start running here, even though there's no enemies or anything out to get you. Just the stress that comes from being there is enough. Here's another place where immersion is preserved by making it less gamey. In most horror titles, there are clear sound cues and things going on sonically which clue you into the situation. There'll be a sound for a monster spawning, a sound for if they're looking for you, and a sound for if they found you. Now, Dead Space does have something like this. Music seems to play if you're close to danger, but it also plays when you're not, and differentiating between the two is intentionally blurry. Often there's so much noise from enemies and the environment and from music stings that it's all just overwhelming, and intentionally so. That relentless assault that you're under from enemies and from the soundscape is necessary because you're just so powerful here, relatively speaking at least. Ammo can be scarce for some weapons, but really you're generally well equipped, so you need to fill your against the odds in other ways. Partly they achieve this through the sluggish movement, intentionally limiting and slow as it is. The constricted field of view directly over his shoulder does a lot to help too. It's claustrophobic and mirrors what it would probably be like inside Isaac's helmet, especially as his head moves around with your camera. You know, I don't want to imply in this video that Dead Space is a perfect game. It's got its flaws. 
There are some pretty ill-advised sections, which, although make for varied gameplay, aren't necessarily fun to play or particularly frightening. There's also those small crawling enemies, which I feel should have just been removed completely. They're a pain in the ass to fight, eating through your health ridiculously fast, and offer annoyingly small targets considering the slow and precise shooting. Something more fundamental though is the melee attacks. Now, Schofield talks in that interview about how great he thinks the melee system is, how superior it is to the game they all looked up to, Resident Evil 4, and while it is cool to look at and breaking open crates is fun, for combat it's next to useless. The hitbox isn't big enough and the enemies move too fast for it to be viable when you run out of ammo. So it's not perfect, but I want to offer a counter to one of the main criticisms I've heard, articulated best by Yahtzee in his Zero Punctuation reviews. Essentially, he feels that the game has no atmosphere because the monsters are blatant. They're just out in the open, under the spotlight, and removed from any idea of subtlety. And it's certainly something to think about. Within the first 10 minutes of the game, the monsters are shown up close in detail, rendering atmosphere building after this a moot point really. If you compare this to Alien Isolation, which spends at least an hour and a half at the beginning building the tension, it does seem to fall flat here. But what I would say is that these are very, very different kinds of games, and specifically very, very different kinds of horror. I may even go so far as to argue that Dead Space innovated its own kind of horror approach, and this comes back to this idea of relentlessness. There are lots of different reasons things are scary. Cosmic horror doesn't have the same appeal as a jump scare, and psychological horror is different to fighting for your life horror, which is what I think Dead Space comes under. Usually horror has to use its downtime building up to a reveal, and then settling down again, only to bring it all back up for another encounter. But Dead Space goes for a straightforward, more dense approach, and its effect is different, unique. Now I love psychological horror, I love when horror messes with its viewer, and I love being creeped out, but this game is not interested in creeping you out, it's interested in stressing you out, and those are two very, very different things. I felt genuinely awful for the first few hours playing this thing. I felt incredibly anxious and at a heightened state of awareness. It's the only way to survive in this world. Be on alert, react to every sound, keep your weapons reloaded and grit your teeth. At any moment something is going to try to kill you and you need to be quick. It's not the kind of horror Yahtzee wanted, but it's horrific and it's tense and it's action packed. At least for the first few hours. Would I say I was scared during the game? Well, if being scared is what I just described, then yes I was. If feeling tremendous anxiety and dread at the idea of opening a new door is horror, then yes I was. It's playing with definitions here I suppose, but I would argue no particular kind of horror takes precedent. They all have their place. Dead Space is horror for the shooter fan, similarly to what Resident Evil became after the third. Work began on Dead Space very shortly after Resident Evil 4, and in many ways it was the original catalyst. But where Resident Evil 4 had a campy B-movie quality, Dead Space wanted to genuinely frighten you. But how do you do that while maintaining the broad appeal of the third-person shooter fans? Give them a hard, hard shooter that makes you feel like the game doesn't want you to succeed. Well, I say hard, I'm having a difficult time trying to figure out if Dead Space is actually hard. It's very possible that it's simply the stress it generated that made me feel so against the odds. For this I played through on hard mode, and although there were a good few sections that gave me a run for my money, overall I think the game tricked me. It tricked me in the same way Resident Evil does. It made me feel like everything was against me, that ammo was always running low and that I was scraping through encounters every time. Maybe I was, maybe I wasn't, but that my friends is what I would call good design. The Resident Evil games scale enemy health and change item drops on the fly depending on your performance, and I wonder whether Dead Space does this too. Again though, the fact I can't tell is a good sign that they did it right. Everything in that moment to moment gameplay feels right in Dead Space. Your rewards feel tangible. Picking up a power node in particular is always exciting because you want to gain that edge. You want more damage for the plasma cutter, you want more health. Perhaps then you'll feel safe, perhaps then you'll feel like a third person action star smiling in the face of this daunting horror game. That's what pushes you forward and it's that gameplay loop that succeeds in hooking you. I'm not saying the entire game is a genius work of art or anything, 
despite my discussions earlier about such things. But Dead Space was still a cut above much of what had come before, and has come since. It's a franchise with a key place in the history of gaming, and of horror in general, and it should be celebrated. There's a remake in the works I hear, and although I'm personally getting a little sick of endless remakes and sequels and lack of new AAA game franchises, I do look forward to this one. Playing back through has reminded me just how far we've come graphically since 2008. This game was barely ready for HD at the time, and on a big computer monitor it's showing its wrinkles in almost every area, bleak and dark as they already are. Funnily enough, one criticism Yahtzee had that I do agree with is the setting being so bleak all of the time, to the point where you couldn't imagine this space station operating normally and people actually living in it. It was built with a horror movie infestation in mind, apparently. But I can let them off that kind of criticism, true as it may be. Besides, that's something they fixed for their next entry. Maybe I'll go through that one next. Thanks for watching, or just listening, whatever the case may be. I'm thinking I might make more of this video essay type content. It's been fun returning to this title and breaking it down in a bit of detail, trying to figure out why things work. It's not the sort of game you'd imagine would require that kind of treatment, but it turns out there's a bit more going on under the hood than my teenage self realised all those years ago. Thanks again, and please do check out my old Amnesia video if you liked seeing horror games broken down and analysed. Other than that, a subscription would mean a lot to me, but mostly I'd like you to comment. What other parts of this game do you feel worked particularly well? And what do you think I should cover next? It's been a pleasure. Take care everyone. Peace.